not a con. Hello. Thank you for attending. My name is Allison Smith, the voice of the Asterisk Open Source PBX. Please be sure that your tables and seat backs are in the upright position and that your seat belt is securely fastened for liftoff. The telephone, as you know it, is about to go bye-bye. At this time, I would like to present Gregory Bainline, Asterisk developer and co-owner of M2Net. Thank you for calling and enjoy the rest of your day. Nothing. Actually, I had to buy her dinner. That was, that was about it. Uh, bought her dinner at Astrocon. But that was, that was it. All right. Um, all things being equal, I'm sure that you guys are going to have some questions. What I'm going to talk about here, and I'll just go into that in a little bit. Uh, this is contact information for me. I'm very open. Feel free to email me. Stop it by our IRC channel, the Asterisk channel on irc.freeno.org. Be happy to chat with you. Uh, channel Asterisk. There's also a bunch of other channels, uh, some of which I won't mention. But uh, feel free to personally ask me any questions or send me an email after this. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born to a family of orangutans in the jungles of Borneo in 1971. And I've been using Linux for about, well, I don't know, 11 years now, is it? 12 years? I can't count very well. So since 1993, uh, I'm the owner of N2Net in Cleveland, one of the owners of N2Net in Cleveland. And uh, we provide mission-critical data service hosting for, oh, pretty much everything, internet services, uh, telephony, vo voice over IP. It was an emerging, emerging market. And uh, most of our stuff is Linux-based, as uh, David was, uh, was talking about earlier this morning. We use some of the same high availability clustering architecture that David uses to make sure that stuff just works. But uh, also, just a comparison. This is me before I shave and after I shave. <laughs> you had to ask, didn't you? Uh, I'm an asterisk developer. Somehow I have stumbled into that community. I didn't really go in there looking to become a developer. Uh, but uh, I was looking for something, something open source that I could devote time to because uh, in the wake of the Cleveland Linux Users Group and all the stuff that we've done here in the area, trying to get Linux out, uh, I had sort of taken a couple of days off and decided I wanted to get into something new and sort of fell into the asterisk community. Um, I have been branded as a bug marshal, although I probably break more stuff than I fix. And I probably... Am, am most well known and, and most well hated for the Ast Wind project, which is asterisk on Windows running on top of CoLinux. It is a bastardization of the utmost form you could can never imagine. <laughs> yes, everybody asked me why, and the answer to that is very simply because Mark gave it to me, and I thought if he's focusing on this, then we got to help him. I, I'll take the responsibility for it. So if he's focused on this, nothing will ever get done. So uh, I also maintain, semi-maintain, semi-unofficially, officially, not much that's official in the asterisk community, but I, I semi-maintain the asterisk RPMs in conjunction with several other people that have built on some of the work that I built on, somebody else's work, and of course standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we have RPMs available for Red Hat 7.3 and 9.0 and also a variety of other platforms such as Fedora. Uh, I am a Red Hat sort of guy myself, uh, although I do love Debian and anything Linux, but uh, that's what it is. Uh, I use Asterisk every single day, both at home and at work. Um, so I am able to talk about it from that perspective. My wife uses it, and uh, if she doesn't know there's a difference, then I think we're going in the right direction. Um, what I'd like to do is just start a little bit by talking about voice over IP. And I, I really don't want to offend anyone, because I, I would assume that you guys probably have a better knowledge of what voice over IP is probably than I do. So by, by order of hands, I just want to ask some questions. Who's using a voice over IP or a tele IP telephony service at home right now over broadband? It's actually less than I thought, OK? Who's planning on using something after this talk, OK? Um, who, who hates the Vonage commercials? Okay, that's a universal. Um, 
Okay, well, let's start with a little bit with talking about what VoIP is. Voice is very simply voice over IP. It means sending voice over the internet protocol. It's pretty simple. You know, anybody ever used IRC? Yeah, well, this is real time communication. So, continually samples audio every 20 milliseconds, about each sample is then converted via codec into a digital format, sent across the wire as a digitized stream reassembled at the other end and output to your telephone device or your telephony adapter or your SIP phone, as it were. Uh, VoIP terminology, just to, to make things quick. Uh, voice over IP. PSTN is what we call the public switch telephone network or the great Satan. <laughs> as us in the ISP industry are fond of calling Ma Bell. Um, don't get me started on SBC, but if you want to hear somebody rant, I can rant with the best about SBC, all tell and other, the other R box. Codec is very simply a digital signaling format or a conversion, uh, a conversion, um, a way to convert uh, audio from one one way to the uh, one format to the other. SIP stands for the Session Initiation Protocol, which is essentially the emerging standard of uh, voice over IP that's being used. Personally, it's an overloaded piece of crap protocol, but that's my opinion. H323 is irrelevant, so who cares? Uh, IX2 is the inter asterisk exchange protocol, which can put about three times more data or three times as many voice calls across the same one megabit pipe as SIP can, which is why we refer to IX2 as being the first protocol that's not a pile of SIP. Why would you want to use VoIP? Does anybody have an answer to why you'd want to use VoIP? Okay. Cost-effective. Two people with VoIP technology on different sides of the world can have a conversation in real time without paying a dime for the call. That's bullshit. Somebody always pays for the call. But very good. <laughs> um, yes, that is what the media is telling you. They are telling you right now that VoIP is cheap. VoIP is going to save you millions of dollars. You need to put VoIP into your enterprise. It's all hype. What you save in long distance minutes, you will, te you will tear up in bandwidth. You cannot put voice over IP across a crappy network. So if you have a satellite link with 800 milliseconds of latency, you are not going to use VoIP, no matter what kind of equipment they tell you. So beware of the marketing hype. VoIP does not necessarily save you a lot of money unless you have a good quality internet connection to use it with. So the increasing penetration of broadband, of course, provides us with lots of extra bandwidth. Uh, aside from BitTorrent and some of the other things that you might use your 5 meg cable modem for, VoIP fits kind of nicely. In 128K, you can send a single call with pretty decent quality. 200K, you can send uh, uh, an awesome quality call. Uh, there's overhead for protocols. We won't get into the details of it, uh, unless, of course, you want to do that. So there is always a catch. There's voice transmission delay, as I mentioned in my satellite discussion. There's call setup, call established, call, call termination issues. You know, the call, that you're, the, the call that you're originating may not necessarily terminate wherever you want it to, um, especially when you're working with some of the free networks. Uh, you have no idea where that stuff is going to end up, if it will end up somewhere at all. Uh, when sometimes you just get the privilege of listening to a busy signal. Um, and we have to maintain backward compatibility with the old Ma Bell network because Let's face it, you're not going to give grandma a Cisco 7960 phone. She just isn't going to get it. The biggest problem I have when I put voice over IP into a company is, well, how does it work? Well, it's a phone. You pick it up and you dial it. But I have to hit send, yes, or you program the dial rules. So people are trained to operate and have been trained to operate with a telephone the same way for 100 years or about thereabouts. So it's hard to get people to change their behaviors and look at their phones as appliances rather than just as phones. Now, phones are, are able to, with SIP and with voice over IP technology and all sorts of wonderful things such as XML and web services, are able to deliver things like porn to your desktop. So well, color, too, on the Cisco 7970s. And actually, really good resolution porn. But. <laughs> That's the thing. I mean, these are now becoming integrated communication devices. I mean, they're not just phones anymore. So that's why when people see a, a SIP phone, they kind of get, get freaked out. Moving onward a little bit, 
There are a couple of telephony standards bodies, uh, ITU, the International Telecommunications Union. They control telephony standards. And of course, the Internet Engineering Task Force, which controls TCP IP standards and that which relate to Internet Engineering Task Force business. And let's talk a little bit about, about the protocols. The two, the two protocols, we'll talk about SIP and H323. Even though H323 is pretty much irrelevant, it's still out there and it works very similar to the way that uh, um, SIP works and some of the other protocols work. IX2 is a little different, doesn't work that way, but uh, I can get into that a little bit later if people want to, want to hear about it. Both groups agree on the basics for encoding and transmitting of audio. Audio is encoded using well-known standards such as pulse code modulation, PCM. So everybody's heard that acronym. I have no idea what it means, but that's what it means. It is what it is. Uh, and then audio is transported using the real-time transfer protocol, RTP. Uh, and RTP messages are then encapsulated in UDP. And that is further encapsulated in an IP datagram for transmission. So if you're, if you're saying, wow, that's a lot of overhead, you're right. That's why it sometimes is better to just run a regular analog phone line if you have low, low, low bandwidth. Um, UDP is used for transport. Does anybody know why? That's right. You, cannot be st you can't really stop playback and wait for somebody's voice. You, know, uh, or you might it get that effect. Well, Just, anyway. It does, well, yeah. <laughs> yes, it does. But now with the new jitter buffer we put in, we have up to 15% packet loss before we, we hear that. 15% packet loss concealment. But that's cool stuff. Written by Bulgarian programmers, by the way, which is probably some violation of the DMCA or DCMA or whatever the hell that law is. But uh, lower overhead audio must be played as arrived. Two independent RP. Ah, there's two independent RTP sessions. This is why SIP sucks. You cannot run it through NAT very well. You have no idea what the source port and destination port are going to be, and it has to go back to the same place it came from. So getting SIP through NAT really, really sucks. There are ways to deal with it, such as S-TON and some other very strange ways. Uh, I mean, if I told you that to, to run voice over IP, all of a sudden you had to open your firewall up for, say, 10,000 ports, you'd probably shoot me and tell me, go away. And I would tell you, OK, we'll use IX2, which is UDP port 4569. It's one port. All your voice and data goes across that. And it's a very, very teeny protocol. So one phone acts as a sender. The other acts as a receiver. Go ahead. Uh, you know, I, I think they have an interesting way to deal about it. I don't know enough about the protocol because the code isn't open. And if it's not open, I really don't care about it. Skype, in my world, is irrelevant. Your businesses don't trust their infrastructure to Skype. Or if they do, they're not a really smart business. And they probably won't be around next year. So uh, I think Skype has actually dealt with those problems in a very interesting way. But I don't know what that is. I don't have enough information to tell you definitively that they did x and y differently. But um, I would assume that it's probably very similar to the way that IEX2 or EX deals with that problem, which is a single UDP port. Could be wrong. <coughs> this is my I know call you're out to there. the R box. I can feel you now. I know that you're afraid. You're afraid of us. You're afraid of change. I don't know the future. I didn't come here to tell you how this is going to end. I came here to tell you how it's going to begin. I'm going to hang up this phone, and then I'm going to show these people what you don't want them to see. I'm going to show them a world without you. This is the thing that AT&T fears the most. Open source telecommunications and PBX and all s stuff that can make you communicate without having to pay a dime, although it's really not free. They love it because they run data across it, but they hate it because any kind of revenue in the industry related to long distance, local toll termination, additional features is going away. And Asterisk as an open source project is really leading the way for companies to take advantage of that. Companies, individuals, what have you. So that being the case, our box are very scared of Asterisk. Although, believe it or not, I can, I can tell you quite frankly that there are several very large cable companies that are using asterisk servers to serve lots of content to their cable modem internet telephony subscribers. And uh, I won't say any names, but uh, <coughs> Cox. <coughs> uh, so 
That being the case, let's dive in a little bit to asterisk. And again, I'm going to read from my slides because I'm lame and lazy and I don't like to prepare very well. Officially, Asterisk is an open source hybrid TDM and Packet Voice PBX and IVR platform. I'll let that sink in. Public branch exchange, interactive voice response. It has ACD capabilities, automated call distribution. It's correct. Unofficially, Asterisk is quite possibly the most powerful, flexible, and extensible piece of integrated telecommunications software available. Its name comes from the Asterisk symbol which, of course, everybody knows is a wildcard symbol in Unix and pretty much virtually all other regular expressions. And similarly, Asterisk, the PBX is designed to interface any piece of equipment with any other piece of equipment and any other application. What we say is that Asterisk is a Swiss Army telephony knife. It is primarily de 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 developed on Linux, and you can run it on just about everything. It's even Windows. There are actually two divergent ports of Asterisk for Windows. There's my project, which is the laughing stock of, of the Asterisk community. But believe it or not, Intel just called me about doing a demo with it at Supercom. I'm like, you want it to work, right? Why don't we just do it on Linux? Um, and on the other side of the time, there's somebody that has actually ported Asterisk to SigWin, which is uh, kind of neat, uh, although he has not yet released the source code. Uh, and by GPL regulations, he is in violation of the GPL because he should release his changes back to the community. So asterisk win32.com, I think it is, yell at him. We want his source code. We want it in the tree. You know? Okay, so it runs on Windows. We won't maintain it, but somebody will. That's the beauty of, a that's the beauty of open source. You know, if, we're, if we don't have the resources to do it, you guys can do it. If you have a need for it, have at it. It runs on a Pentium 133 or better. And I'm going to actually tell you that, that I have seen with my own eyes and played with Asterisk running on the WRT54GS. <laughs> and it kicks ass. <laughs> We're talking voicemail, SIP, everything. In fact, I'll be speaking at ISPCon in Baltimore in May. And I'll be talking with the gentleman that's doing it. There's actually like five or six people that have ported it. But Brian Kapausch, the guy that runs Palavarnet, has hooked up 800 square miles of Indiana with WRT sitting on the top of grain silos <laughs> and has analog FXO lines coming in and basically has killed the rural telco because he just crosses LATA boundaries and says, it's unregulated, screw off. <laughs> and he's using the WRT54GS to do, do entirely that. Question? Um, I'm assuming that uses some sort of external storage? No. JFS file system. Well, you, you can do it a couple of different ways. Uh, and I, I guess I can go off on a tangent. The, uh, there are two different branches of asterisk, and I'll get into that a little bit later. One is the stable branch, which is really not very stable. And the other is the head branch, which is totally a mess. That's where we put everything. That's where we put everything that's new. And by new, I mean things like asterisk real time, which basically lets you do every, all of your, store all of your data into a SQL database which in Brian's case, he's using asterisk real time to have a central database server to configure his, his network of WRTs running asterisk. So he puts a configuration into a SQL table on a central database. He makes a call. It's instantly available on the WRT. But yes, with, with OpenWRT on, the, on the, uh, the WRT, you have JFFS file system, so you can do reads and writes. And they have 32 megs, which is plenty. I mean, really, it is. I mean, for a small voicemail system at your home, that's fine, too. And you can run BGP and OSPF on it, too, a la Quagga, and do really strange policy routing stuff with it. Uh, I, love the, I love that box. Um, I used to run my, my home PBX on a Pentium 133 for a while until the drive crashed on it. And again, I, I'm probably the biggest laughing stock of the asterisk community because I'm like, well, it doesn't work on Pentium 1. They're like, whoa. whoa. What? <laughs> Why would you want to run it asterisk on a Pentium 1? Well, it's what I have. What I use. It's a $15 PC. What am I going to do with it? You know, it heats the room. I'm not going to turn it off. I'm freeze to death. <laughs> so basically, getting back to the getting back to the topic at hand, asterisk is any call, anytime, anywhere, from anything to anything else. And just to get into that a little bit, <clears throat> to talk about the asterisk development model, it kind of looks like this. And that's very similar. I looked around for the Linux development model, and this picture came up. <laughs> From the outside, that's what it looks like. I mean, obviously, everybody says, yeah, it's, it's total chaos. Well, 
as uh, Eric Raymond has, has, uh, has pointed out in the Cathedral and the Bazaar, out of chaos can come some pretty beautiful stuff. Linux is a prime example of that. So it's very similar to Linux in its development model. The, uh, there are two different trees and uh, trees of code. One is the stable branch, and the other is the is the 1.1 CVS head branch. Mark Spencer is the owner of Digium, is the birth, uh, the the father, if you will, of Asterisk, has basically given it to the world, and uh, he's pretty much equivalent to Linus Torvalds or Linus Torvalds or Linus or however you want to say his name. I can never get it right. Uh, there is a group of core developers with CVS commit rights, and they have smartly not given me CVS commit writes because anything that I write usually breaks more than it fixes. Um, we have Asterisk developer conferences roughly weekly, um, which are essentially handled on Asterisk, whereby we will dial in with VoIP and we will uh, have conversations about Asterisk. We'll have an agenda. It's actually been, been pretty cool lately because it's been fairly organized, whereas before it was total chaos. Mark would show up, everybody shut up, and he'd think we were working. And he's like, wow, you do this all the time. Then he'd leave, and of course, just total BS would, would happen for the next six hours. But we essentially use Asterisk to develop Asterisk, and we use Asterisk to communicate with people um, in all sorts of different areas of the world. I was, I was floored when I went down to Atlanta at Astrocon this year to find out that there was 36 countries represented. There were people from countries I'd never even heard of before. I couldn't pronounce half their names. I couldn't understand most of them, but they were there. And it was probably 50-50, 50% people native to the United States, and the rest of them were out, out of the country. What I found from that is that Asterisk is making a huge inroad in some of the, in the rest of the world. I mean, people are deploying this at an incredible rate outside of the United States, not to mention that they're probably deploying it pretty fast inside the United States. But uh, it, was, uh, it was fairly interesting. Um, just blew my mind a bit. Uh, diagrams, pretty pictures. Uh, Asterisk kind of has a modular architecture that's tied together by some APIs. This is about as technical as this will get, folks. So if you're looking at the guts of Asterisk, uh, I'll leave this up for a while so you can absorb it. There are four different APIs. There's an application API, which lets you write applications to interact with the other APIs, such as the Asterisk file format API, which can write stuff as WAV files or MP3 files or AU files which then can interact with the Asterisk Channel API, which basically will take different channels, hardware, uh, PSTN connectivity, VoIP, what have you, and will allow you to interact with all these other things. And then, of course, the Codec Translator API. Since Asterisk is a Swiss Army knife, it's important because we, have no, we never know what codec we're going to get in and what we have to put out. We may get ULA in on a PRI through the Channel API, and we may have to convert that to G729 and send it out through the SIP channel. So the engineering behind Asterisk is pretty cool in the fact that you can take any channel from any, and any, and any codec and turn it into something else and interact with it. The Asterisk application API lets you basically interact with voice calls and phone calls from shell scripts. I mean, use what you want. You want to run, like, you know, Perl? Go ahead, run Perl. You want to run C? That's fine. There's somebody who's actually, you know, you guys are familiar with Mod, uh, Mod Perl for Apache? Somebody wrote Res Perl. It's a Perl interpreter that loads native inside Asterisk and lets you just embed code in your dial plan. It's, it's bizarre, but it works. And of course, as, you know, open source, the best of stuff sometimes makes it. Sometimes just really retarded stuff makes it too. Like, like res.php and res.net or what is the... Mono, res mono, I mean, totally not aware of threads, blows up everything, but it's there. I mean, somebody will fix it if it's important, I guess, but just really, really strange stuff. So there's a central scheduler and uh, I.O. manager that lets you uh, basically tag everything in and out to keep things so that you, your packets are, are ordered and delivered in an orderly fashion. And a PBX switching core and all that kind of good stuff. Anybody have any questions about this picture? Go ahead. Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to answer that later, but the, the answer is it answered it, anything. You give me anything and I'll plug it up to it. As long as it speaks standard PSTN protocols, I'll plug it into anything. Uh, 
I have seen the conference calls have like two people on it, and I've seen it scale up to like 50. And I've seen when we've done, when we've done announcements or broadcasts from, like for, for example, Astrocon, we've had cascaded conference services with several thousand people on them where we have all sorts of crazy stuff going on. We'll have one and then a bunch of them joined into another and it takes about three seconds to deliver the packets to everybody, but it's, it's there. Um, you know, I said it's modular architecture like the, like the Linux kernel. It has, it has its own console, which is great, because you can actually load and drop components. You know, let's say you're working on a highly available mission critical PBX for a customer. And all of a sudden, you see on the asterisk users mailing list that a really important SIT bug has come out that fixes a problem with your Polycom phones that has been pissing you off for three months. You can't take down the, the, the phone, you can't take down the PBX during business hours, but you need to get that fix in because it'll save your, you know, them from calling you every day. And so essentially you just recompile it, unload and reload, bam, you're done. You've basically unloaded that SIP channel and reloaded it, and now the new behavior is there, everything re-registers and you're back in normal. Not everything is that clean in the 1.0 stable branch, but it's pretty clean in the CVS head. You can basically unload everything and take asterisk down to a very, very small footprint. What this is good for, for those of you that are looking at embedding asterisk, because most people, uh, that's, what, that's what's happening now. A lot of people are embedding asterisk into things like the WRT and that little ethernet sized thing that was on Slashdot a couple of weeks ago. Somebody's got it, going to have it running on that. Just matter of time. Yeah, my, here's my phone system. Yeah, well, what, what do I do with it? Just plug your phone into it. So, so it's, it's nice in that fact, and it's kind of cool. Channels, codecs, applications, oh my. Uh, call flow and asterisk. Uh, pretty simple, really. There's, there's calls come in on channels. So a call comes in on a PSTN channel, wildcard channel. Uh, Digium makes this hardware called Wildcard, so that interfaces with the PSTN. So it comes in on your phone line, comes into the Wildcard channel. And then basically it's handed off to uh, a dial plan, which is configured in the extensions.com file, which then you can define, hey, I want to answer that call. I want to see if it's from my ex-girlfriend. And if it is, I want to dump it. If it's not, I want to take the call. And I'm going to then send it to these three phones. And one of those phones can be in China or it can be in your bedroom or, you know, wherever you want. So then the, the dial plans contain logical sections of matches called contexts. Anybody, you know, subroutines maybe, however you want to call it. And each channel sends a call into the dial plan with a context name and a dialed number. So I take all my inbound calls and I deliver them to the default context because that's the default behavior. And then I say, okay, if it's from this number and it's to this number, I'm going to treat it this way. If it's from this number and it's to this number, I'm going to treat it this way, and I'm going to hand it off here. And of course, those, those dial plan steps can be shell scripts that you write. So I'm going to take that call. I'm going to look up the source number in a MySQL database. I'm going to then use Festival to read back the person's balance that's available, and then I'm going to hang up on them because they have a negative balance. It's, it's very, very simple, and once you drink the Kool-Aid, you never go back. Um, the dial plan matches with modified regular expressions. The number dialed and each match on the dialed number has an order of steps. It's kind of like a horrible basic Frankenstein without the flexibility, but you can work with it. Different channels that are available kind of get to back, your, back to your question. There's a CAPI channel that lets you connect with ISD and CAPI devices, H323, if you have H323 devices and they work. Um, IEX2, which is what we use to communicate between asterisk servers because it's much more efficient than SIP. ISDN for Linux, there uses the ISDN for Linux driver in the kernel. MGCP, which is the Media Gateway Control Protocol driver. SCCP, which is Cisco Skinning Control Protocol, and SIP, and ZAP. ZAP being Zaptel, the Digium hardware, um, Jim Dixon, Zaptel project, whole other story, long story. But uh, so essentially, it, what, you, what you can do is you can go to eBay and you'd say, I'd like, like to find a, a Cisco IP phone. And pretty much any Cisco IP phone that you get, we're going to have a channel driver for. If it speaks SIP, we use the SIP channel driver. If it speaks Skinny, we use the Skinny channel driver. And the SCCP and Skinny dri drivers will mostly work for you. Sometimes there's some bugs, and they're not really widely, widely deployed, but they work. Uh, codecs that are supported. 
Um, codecs are either very high bandwidth, like G711, uh, ULAW, and ALAW. These are the protocols that are currently used on the current PSTN. So if you're using a modem, you're speaking ULAW or ALAW. If you're in, the, if you're in Europe, if you're in the United States, it's ULAW. So essentially, G711 ULAW, we just pass that through to any PBX. Uh, if you have PRI on that PBX, asterisk can act as a PRI. Uh, we can act as a switch and switch that call out. So uh, as far as your P PBX is concerned, you just see a, an NI2 switch on the other side, which is kind of nice. We do all sorts of crazy stuff with that. Um, G726, 723. If you really, really, really want to impress your friends, you can sound like Mr. Roboto by using LPC10. That is a protocol that I think is like 4K of overhead. How do you fit voice in 4K? Listen to it, you'll find out. <laughs> Very bad, but there are people that call in over satellite links from the conference, and I have no idea what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> but G729A is, a, is probably the best balance between uh, compression and sound quality. It's cell phone quality is what I like to call it, but it's an 8K of overhead. That means we can put about, in one megabit with IEX2, we can put roughly 40 calls across a one megabit connection. You got five megabits on your cable modem? That's great, down. Up, you got what, 256, 512? Well, okay, so maybe you can support 20 calls at home on your cable modem with G729. It is a licensed codec, you do have to buy it from Digium, or if you're, you know, want to, you can go and buy the pre, or get the pre-compiled stuff from non-extradition countries that have it pre-compiled. I won't mention where you can get those, but they're out there. Applications and asterisk. Um, asterisk includes this thing called the AGI, or Asterisk Gateway Interfa Inter Interface, which is essentially very similar to CGI. And AGIs basically take standard input and standard output and do stuff with them. So you can basically have an asterisk command in your dial plan that says, uh, you know, go out in page Bob that Joan called and uh, send it out and come back in and then send, J send Joan into a meet me room until Bob calls back. So uh, it basically lets you do interact with, uh, with um, the shell scripts, whatever your, whatever, your, whatever your language is. If it speaks standard in, standard out on Linux, you got it. You, know, you want to write it in Python, be my guest. Uh, there is something that's just come out uh, at Astrocon in September called Fast AGI, which lets you attach that to a socket now, the beauty of this is that basically if you have a large number of asterisk servers that are all speaking AGI, you can then put your central processing on a big box or cluster of servers, again, using some of the high availability and load balancing stuff that David was talking about early, and take all of your application overload and just leave the boxes on the gateway to speak to the PSTN and talk to your clients and have all your application processing out in the rest of the world. Um, just, uh, how am I doing on time, by the way? 30 minutes. Okay, cool. Um, just some simple commands like answer. Uh, anybody want to venture a guess what that does to a channel? Hang up. You're wrong. It doesn't hang up. It only hangs up when I, when I program it, it hangs up. But answer basically answers a channel. Background, that's kind of cool. It plays a file in the background while it's listening for DTMF. So, for example, thank you for calling. You know, you're number 647 in line. You will never have your call answered. If you'd like to leave a message, press 1. And then, of course, it can prattle on for the next 30 menu options. And while that's playing, it will basically listen for DTMF in the background. So I'm sure you can think of a lot of things to do that with menus for clients. We do that kind of thing. Background detect will, will basically play a file in the background. will detect when someone's talking and then do something when they talk. So, for example, you could then take that and send that off to some sort of voice recognition software, which to this point, nothing really good open source exists that I'm aware of. If anybody ha can prove me wrong on that, please do, because we would love to have basically voice command in asterisk, but we don't have it yet. For recognizing speech? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you, if you have like zero to nine, or last year we did swear words. <laughs> <laughs> Can I get that dictionary? Voice over audible cuss words. Yes. <laughs> that, that, you know, that, that, that's an RFC right there. <laughs> TCP delivered by Tourette's. Almost as good as the uh, TCP by carrier pigeon RFC. 
Uh, busy, indicate busy conditions and stop. When you get a call from your ex-girlfriend, the anti-ex-girlfriend logic as it's called in the community and you don't want to hear it, you can just give her a busy signal. Or in my case, I had mistakenly given my wife's phone number to a photography studio who called about our kids and they called every single day for six weeks at dinner time. Finally, I said, I want that phone number and I basically played an out of order tone for them. So I recorded an out of order tone from the, from the, the network and when they called they got beep, you have been dis this number has been disconnected. Documentation? This is open source. <laughs> what manual? Let me rephrase that. How hard is the UI? The UI is pretty simple once you get into it. It's brain dead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The manual is spelled source, S-O-U-R-C-E. No, actually, uh, and, it, and that's, that's kind of a joke. There is an asterisk docs project at asterisk docs.org. The more features you have, the more complicated you have to do it. That's right. And of course, developers hate documenting their code, so most of the stuff in, in head is not documented unless you read the source. However, stable, and I will suggest this, asterisk docs.org is an open, community-driven documentation project, which is fantastic. Um, Blitzrage, Leaf Madsen, and the other guy, Steve, and I can't remember his name, um, they roomed with me down in Atlanta, uh, and they, they have just done, I was not even aware of their project until they did a speech on it, but it blew me away. They're using DocBook, and they're using CVS as the back end, so you can check out specific chapters, and if something doesn't work, fix it and recommit it. And it builds PDF, um, and all sorts of text and, and HTML and all sorts of different versions. I'd encourage you, asterisdocs.org. Check it out. It's really cool. Then also <coughs> is another gentleman that runs the voipinfo.org wiki, voip-info.org, or voip-info.org wiki, which basically is the, collective, the other source of collective knowledge. If you want to know about how to get asterisk to work with, uh, um, for example, Cisco. Would anybody believe that Cisco implemented a non-open power over Ethernet standard for their phones? Shocked. I was, and I was pissed. So I wired up a cable to make it work with a standard PoE injector. So far, my phones haven't fried. But uh, that's on there, for example. Just you know, how, to wear, how to make a Cisco power over Ethernet cable with a power over Ethernet injector. Uh, all sorts of good stuff is up there. You know, how to get it uh, to work with 2.6.11 on Gen 2. Um, anything you can imagine. You know, <coughs> all sorts of stuff. It also has a stuff not specifically related to Asperger's. Say, for example, you buy a Cisco phone off eBay. That's right. How to upgrade to Cisco mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. All the good stuff. Um, does anybody really want me to tell you more about the applications? MP3 player, that's cool. Dial in MP3. You know, choose what hold music you'd like to hear. Uh, send image and send text and send URL. These are kind of cool commands because it basically takes those phones that speak SIP and lets us send an image. For example, we could take AGI, find out what someone's caller number is, pull a JPEG image name out of a database, send it to a client and display it on their phone. Really kind of cool. Uh, you know, or you know, in my case, it would be a monkey. But Send a URL. We can send a URL to screen pop to uh, a daemon listening on a, uh, a workstation and then pop up, uh, uh, you know, FARC, for example. Uh, system. Execute a system command. Oh, got to love that for security, right? <laughs> if you are concerned about law enforcement raiding your house, dial 99 to rm rf. <clears throat> um, Transfer, you can transfer a caller to a remote extension. Uh, we use this extensively to transfer calls. Voicemail, it has a pretty robust voicemail system. It's on its third implementation right now. And I got to tell you, it's, it's OK and it works. It's better than most of the commercial ones out there. But man, I just want really cool things like having access to my voicemail box from IMAP, which is something that no commercial vendor would ever ever consider doing, but I want to do it. And uh, so we've talked about stuff like that and just talked about all sorts of wacky things. Uh, voicemail system is really cool. It'll email you your voicemails and say, you got a three minute call from Bob, uh, this phone number, suggest you check it out, click here to hit listen to the attachment and boom, you got it. Question? Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. And virtual, virtual, virtual voicemail systems that can have virtual, you can segment it. So if you want to do a virtual PBX service, such as what we do with Antunet's Univoice product, you could use Asterisk to do that. So you can basically create different contexts of users within voicemail. That leads to the next question, is backend via LDAP? No. It could be, if you'd like. With real-time, real-time is designed to basically take any configuration data from uh, a middleware layer that you could define what the back end is. So if you wanted to write an LDAP back end to, to plug into real time, that would probably be trivial the way they've implemented it in CVS Head. Um, and in fact, there was somebody was talking about LDAP. I don't know what the hell they were talking about, directory services or something like that with LDAP. I mean, why would you want to do directory services in LDAP? I mean, it's designed for that. Um, and of course, we take the most people don't ever use stuff for what it's designed for. Um, dial, place a call and connect to the current channel. This is what you do. If, for example, we want to dial 619-2000 and you want to call me, you just use the dial command. Directory provides a directory of voicemail extensions. This kind of gets to your point. Can you create different extensions for users and all that? Yes, you can. Dial by first name, dial by last name. Um, let's see. Uh, music on hold. The entire music on hold system in stable is based on MPG123. So you can just put a bunch of MPGs, M, uh, MP3s into a directory and boom, there's your hold music. Uh, so when the system is actually has you in a hold state, you're listening to MP3s. And of course, you can then get patches to actually stream those in the native codec so you don't have to beat the crap out of your system converting from MP3 to some other codec. So you can basically use what they call um, Native MOH3, which is a patch. Well, you can Google for it. Native MOH3 gives you native music on hold. You just basically use socks and convert your MP3s to G720, G711 or G729. Yes. Do you have like a free Yeah. There's, there's a million hacks. I mean, yeah, it could be that simple. But native MOH, native MOH is a little bit more intensive than that because it actually plugs in directly into the PBX. So. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there is <laughs> there is now a make MPG one two three. Yeah, it goes and fetches it, makes it. So, um, so you don't have to worry about the stupidity anymore. I mean, it's still stupid, but. Yes. Anybody that runs stable is, you know, old. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Going on. Well, that was really obnoxious, and I thought my ring was obnoxious. Asterisk scripting, the dial plan scripting ties applications and channels together. AGI, asterisk gateway interface. I probably jumped ahead here. Native C APIs. If you are a purist and you want to write it in C, go, go right ahead. The APIs are there, albeit undocumented. Um, but if you're writing in C, you probably don't need documentation anyways. Uh, and now is where I shill for Digium. Uh, Digium is the primary supporter of asterisk development. And we really owe Digium a, a big debt of gratitude for taking the leap to become an open source company, with a caveat, which I'll get to. Digium has basically put their ass on the line to create all of the wildcard hardware that works particularly well with Asterisk. The FXO cards that are based on um, the ambient chipset, the, um, the FXS cards, and the T1 cards, and the PRI cards, and all sorts of stuff. They basically own the CVS servers, the bug system, the mailing lists. They pay for all that. Um, they, approve all, they approve all the features that are submitted into Asterisk by the community. And of course, they, uh, they own the disclaimers for all of the code contributed to Asterisk because they are the holders of the copyrights to Asterisk. Now, one word, SCO. That is why Asterisk had to take the way that it did. They didn't want to have any liability, and they wanted the ability to be able to license the code outside of the GPL. So they can snapshot it and sell it to somebody who can build a product on it. And that person can have it outside of the GPL. 
Anybody that is going to contribute code to Asterisk has to first submit a disclaimer to Digium, which basically says you're giving up your rights to the code. Now, a lot of developers that are purists will say, well, that's bullshit in your terms, or the words from the gentleman in the back. But it works pretty well, and it really protects them from the liability. So again, Digium does get disclaimers from all contributors. And generally, everybody's happy. If you don't like it, don't contribute. Or you know, fork the project. Form something else. You can always do that if, if you'd like. Any questions on that? In an open source world, that often raises a lot of like or outrage. Yes. Yes. Have they done anything? No. The last fork that I was on the mailing list for has uh, about four messages in six months. Um, generally, I would say that asterisk is a bit immature to fork right now. However. Don't let, that be, don't let that be interpreted as asterisk is an immature product. It's been around for six years. It's got a lot of code behind it. And as convoluted as some of it may be, it works really, really damn well. So it's a little immature as a project because the momentum and the real coders have just, in the past two years, really started contributing significant amounts to the core of the system. So this gets back to your question about how do I connect my asterisk system to the rest of the world? Well, most of us are going to want to connect to the PSTN. And most of us have a phone line, I'd hope. Well, some of you probably just use cell phones. Yep. Well, and this card is not for you. If you have a phone line from SBC or one of the other evil empires, you can purchase a Digium X100P card which is basically a fixed single port adapter. And essentially, it is a wind modem of some type that Digium has written drivers to work with. So essentially, you can take inbound calls. In my house, all my inbound calls come in over an SBC phone line, are delivered into this card, and then are delivered anywhere I want them to. And essentially, when people call, uh, they can, you know, I have control then over caller ID and what I do with those calls. So this is uh, about, I don't know, 90 bucks for the card. Uh, they have a four-port module, which is modular. These little red and green things you can plug in. Um, red is FXS, meaning that you can pr put a phone on it. And, and uh, green is FXO, meaning you can put a line into it. And you can put any combination of these in. So you could, have, you could build a four-line PBX for about 500 bucks with your hardware, put uh, some $65 SIP phones on it. Or just run soft phones on something like your pocket PC if you want the Wi-Fi and be done with it. Uh, and then they have for the big boys they have T100 card and the TE405P. These are the types of cards we run in our data center, which basically take ISDN PRI 23 or 24 channels, uh, channel ice T1 for 24 channels, and up to 96 concurrent calls in one card. So if you really want to start doing some serious stuff with asterisk, PRI is probably the way to go. This is what we'll put in on our client site and turn into, for example, we'll take these and put them in, plug them into a traditional telephony system that has channelized T1 or PRI and basically deliver PRI to them over a, an internet connection with quality of service. So of course, if you uh, want to take, take it with you, the Digium IXY is a one port Ethernet FXS handset. I mean, this thing is probably this big in reality. It's small. It was designed to basically be built from about $10 worth of Radio Shack parts. And uh, you plug one into a LAN, the other into your phone, and you basically calls back home, registers to your asterisk server. It doesn't matter if you're through NAT, triple NAT, quadruple NAT, what have you. One IX2 port, 4569 UDP. And uh, they have the, uh, a modified version of the I'm Too Sexy for My Shirt song. And they call these EXIs. I don't know how you get EXI out of IEXY. I look at that and go IXE. But hey, they invented it, so they can call it whatever the hell they want. Uh, Sapura SPA 2000-3000 are analog telephony adapters, which basically take Ethernet on one side, speak SIP to your asterisk server, and on the other side will give you two phone ports. And the 3000 model will give you an analog line that, that you can plug into your phone line. So you get uh, one inbound line from your uh, your telephone uh, provider, your telco, and uh, two ports out to your phones. Now, in my particular case, I have an inbound line coming into my asterisk server through the, the FXO card, 
And all of my analog phones are actually still on the same first pair of wire. My second phone line, or my phone line comes into my second pair, comes into the asterisk box, is routed back to the Sapura, and then goes out to the first pair and powers all the phones. So again, my wife has no idea. She just knows when something doesn't work. Um, but then I can just blame Bell. Uh, verbiage uh, is supposedly coming out with an IAX2 ATA. Uh, so far, it's vapor, uh, and it's top secret. And it's based on the Firefly IAX stack. Now, Firefly is kind of cool because uh, I should mention a little bit about soft phones here. Firefly is a free soft phone that speaks IAX2 and SIP that you can download from Verbiage's website if you want to start playing with Asterisk. And if you want to start playing with Asterisk, talk to me and I can get you DIDs in Cleveland. We have lots of them. And of course, we'll monitor everything you say on them. So don't use them for anything illegal. Um, that's another thing. You can record everything with Asterisk. So whoever was concerned about like legal Kalia stuff, pff, hey, you want to record a call? One button, boom. You want to reassemble. We've got this cool thing called ChanSpy now, which basically lets us uh, drop in and reassemble SIP packets on the fly. So we can basically just sniff a network and boom, listen to the conversation. Cool stuff. Um, verbiage IXA ATA. What's cool about it is, is, is it runs Linux. Their ATA. Their software, however, obviously runs on top of Windows, or obviously or not so obviously. SNOM, um, these guys basically took Linux and embedded it into a phone. And the phone works OK. It's not great, but it works pretty cool. You can actually get in there and modify it if you were so uh, desired to do that. Um, try one at the demo table. I don't have a demo table here. This is from an older presentation. So I guess you're SOL on that. But uh, most, of these, the, most of these phones, these SIP phones, have multiple line appearances, three, four, six, seven, seven lines at once, that let you basically um, have multiple calls, which is kind of cool. You can conference people, transfer people, what have you. Uh, IP Dialog SIP Tone is another SIP phone that runs Linux. I haven't played with one. Supposedly a decent phone, inexpensive. The Grandstream Budget Tone, which is what we refer to as the Barbie Tone, because it feels like a Barbie phone. If you've ever seen one of those, if you ever had a younger sister. It's the cheapest of all SIP phones. It is amazingly stable. Although it feels like the worst piece of crap you could ever imagine, it works really well. It's probably one of the most stable phones that we've found. And they, they, they're 65 bucks. So if you want a cheap phone to start playing, uh, this is, it's great. I mean, it's not great quality. It's got big buttons and it, you know, it's just, Poorly engineered, but it works really well. That's right. That's right. I used to make comments that the only way to really see a grand stream like sparkle, you know, and see it really do its thing was to put it in the oven. Um, so w once you get your software, whether you're going to use a SIP phone, you can use a couple of different stacks on top of Linux. Uh, I've never tried them. Because, uh, well, I just haven't had the time. There's too much out there to play with. There are several Linux stacks. I won't go into details. Does anybody have any comments on Linux stacks that speak SIP or IAX2? I know Myth TV's got a SIP phone plugin. So you can basically talk on your television. <laughs> Put a mic on top of it, I guess. Uh, dial, by, dial by remote control. OK. There you go. Uh, but once you, get, once you get all that stuff up, you, if you want to actually, you can, without putting in any hardware to plug into the regular telephone network, you can pick up and get yourself an account with an internet telephony service provider, well, a new buzzword, an ITSP. It's all people are going to be talking about at, at ISPCon. I can't wait. Basically, we give you dial tone over the internet. So essentially, we'll, we'll let you connect with your SIP devices or your IX2 devices, and we'll give you a phone number that we will terminate into our equipment, deliver over your broadband connection to your asterisk box or your phone, uh, AKA Vonage. Um, this is called VOPI, Voice Over the Public Internet. And I wouldn't trust it for you know, your bread and butter, but it works pretty damn well. Um, we do a lot of stuff with that now, and it's surprising. But it's only a matter of time until uh, you know, the government steps in and says, well, you can't tinker with Vonage's packets, which, of course, they did recently. 
Um, so I, I kind of asked Chairman Michael Pollitt at Vaughn in San Jose, I said, so does that mean that I can't block spam from entering my network? Oh, no, 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 that's not what we meant. That's what your decision says. It says that we have the ability to block whatever packet. We can't block any packets from an ITSP. So if the ITSP is spamming, we can't block them. No, 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 they can't block them. Doesn't mean they can't deprioritize them. <laughs> Quality of service and outright packet block. I mean, they can deliver them, albeit 30 minutes later. <laughs> they just have really big buffers. And they play with the order of the packets, too. But uh, yeah, so anyways, you can purchase an account from an ITSP. Uh, there's a lot of Lemonade ITSPs. Uh, get them now, get them while they're cheap because they won't be around too long. Uh, this is one of those industries that will pop up and go away as quicker than you can blink an eye. Um, uh, we have such a service and we kind of laugh about it, but we do have such a service called Univoice and we use it primarily for small business. It's really not intended for residential usage, but we do, for the hell of it, just give out DIDs to people that are doing asterisk development. So if you have something to contribute and you have a disclaimer on file with Digium, and you want to help advance the project, give me a call and I will be happy to give you some stuff to play with. Um, in our particular case, we try to avoid delivering any kind of internet telephony service over any network that we can't control, which means we don't really deliver it over the public internet. We'll do it from our core router on, up into a client over a private T1 with quality of service on both ends. So we, uh, we can use SIP or IX2, those are what we spec to work on our, on our equipment. Um, Another gentleman that I feel compelled to mention because he's really big and he'll beat me up if I don't. His name is Jeremy McNamara and he's actually the author of the H323 channel driver. So if there's anybody that actually wants H323 to work, uh, he has it working. He actually uh, runs a CLEC out of Michigan and has uh, 1.6 cent per minute 800 numbers. I've got a couple pointed at my house just for the hell of it. So you can basically PayPal them like 30 bucks and they'll give you an 800 number. I did that like a year and a half ago and I still have like two hours left on my account. I don't, I mean, we, we did all of the Linux Fest development. We basically had meet me conferences and, and people coming in from Columbus and Michigan and all sorts of stuff. And so I just said, use this number. Here's a meet me room. You can go and have a conference. And they, that's how they did all their organization. And, and I looked and it's, I don't know, it's incredible. I mean, you'd, you'd imagine that you probably, the average person at Lixon goes, $29.95 a month for unlimited calls, that's great. Yeah, well, look at your phone bill. You're probably only doing about $3 a calls. The rest of it's taxes and BS that the, that the telco is charging you. So use your broadband, avoid that. You know, hasten the demise of SBC any way that you possibly can. Let's relegate them to just be wire carriers and manage the copper and let the people that really know what they're doing manage the network. I'm not bitter. Other ITSPs that you can choose from, Broad Voice, which supports IX2 and SIP, Voice Pulse, there's too many to count. Again, like I said, the Lemonade Stand ITSP is a term that comes up a lot. There's people coming up and just saying, oh, we've got all this massive bandwidth and we set up all this stuff to these gateways and we're an ITSP. And then three weeks later, their packets stop working. So, questions. And anybody that asks questions, I have lots of Digium swag to give away. These cool calculators and... Uh, these Digium throwing stars, or CDs, I think they are. <laughs> These are brand new. These are from Vaughn this year. Uh, and they've got lots of stuff on them. Here. Hey, come on up and grab a couple if you want. Uh, so question. Uh, we go through Easton as a carrier. I don't know who the hell they, put, they send our international stuff to. They broker it to like several. Okay. And it, it is like H323, that's it, end of discussion. That's because they invested billions of dollars in H323 equipment when they thought it would be the standard. Exactly. So we've got to send our calls in H323 to somewhere in China before we write it out. But it's the best price. Yeah, well, hey. Right. <laughs> uh, again, we don't deliver over the public internet. We have PRI interconnects. And I don't, yeah, with small business and business termination, I don't screw around. All right, you in the back. Yeah. Wow. See, they, I should have gotten on the basketball team. Questions? Yeah, I'm interested in uh, some of the like, ACD features and things like that. Um, 
Mm -hmm. I've been looking around, but I really haven't seen a lot of uh, talk about that. Um, it's almost a, a sort of, yeah, it does that too kind of thing. It's really, really powerful. The ACD functionality in Asterisk will, will give you queuing announcements telling you what number you are in queue, what your average hold time is, uh, and, and lets you completely configure everything about the, the, the thing. But they did that like three years ago, and it just works. Um, there are probably a couple there. If you want, you want to have a longer discussion about that. I'll be in the bar. Buy me a beer. Thank you. Ne you're welcome. Next question. All right. Um, we don't. At our house, we don't have much. And uh, so we went bought into the fifteen dollar month plan. Uh huh. And the soft phone account. No, but it's like five hundred minutes. Okay. Um, you ever hit the five hundred minutes? No, we were at hundred. Yeah. Yeah. But, You'd be uh, better off basically buying as you go. Buy, buy $20 worth of stuff from, from somebody and just use it until they tell you, hey, you're out low. That way you can spend, you can spend instead of spending 15 bucks a month, right. you could be spending, you know, maybe $50 a year. So, but that would be like terminate the number for you and then you get some phone number you're saying? Well, let's say you choose new phone. You want an 800 number. You say, I want an 800 number. I'm going to PayPal you 20 bucks. He'll send you a snippet of config for your asterisk box, speaking IX2. And then what you do with it once you get it into your box is entirely up to you. It could be a hard phone with uh, some of the Digium hardware or the Sapura hardware that I showed. It could be a SIP phone, like a Cisco 7960 plugged directly into Ethernet. It could be an H323 phone. It could be a, a Cisco with skinny protocol on it. So essentially, once you get into your asterisk box, you could then turn around and deliver that over your your, your regular telephone line to your cell phone, which I do sometimes when I'm traveling. Uh, so basically, anything that you can imagine doing with it, you can do with it. More questions? All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.